My name is Dr. Sean McFate. I'm a professor of war at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and at the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. I'm also a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, a Washington, D.C. think tank. And I'm here to talk to you about my new book, The New Rules of War. It is a nonfiction book. It was named a book of the year by The Economist and is at, on West Point's Commandant's reading list. It's been translated into several languages, including a new title in the United Kingdom called Goliath, Why the West Isn't Winning and What We Must Do About It. The central question of this book, or rather before I get to that, I wrote this book because I was angry. Like some of you, I suspect I've lost good friends in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. And as a U.S. taxpayer, it sickens me to see the country spend trillions of dollars in those places with nothing to show for it. Nothing to show for it. And as a vet, I find it hateful to see the American honor tarnished by low-level foes. Yet we have the best military in the world. And it's not just the United States, it's the West. We have the best militaries in the world. Even our adversaries acknowledge that. We have the best troops, the best training, technology, money, you name it. Yet, if we're honest with ourselves, we haven't won a major war since 1945, since World War II. So, what's the problem? If we have the best military in the world, why can't we win wars? And we've been at war for 70 years against somebody. What's the problem? And this is the central question of the new rules of war, that it answers. The answer, bottom line up front, is this. Warfare has moved on, but we have not. We remain stuck in the past, in past glory days. Meanwhile, our adversaries have adapted to modern warfare, and that's why the U.S. struggles against the Taliban and others. The reason why the United States struggles, as do some others in the West, is because we have victor's curse. Perhaps you've heard the adage, generals always fight the last war, especially if they won it. Well, this truism happens to be true, and it's victor's curse. Now, to understand what victor's curse says, let's go backwards in time. Let's get in a time machine, go back 100 years, and visit this war, World War I one of the most horrific wars in human history. Now, when it concluded, France had a bad case of victor's curse. And they thought that the future of war would look just like the last successful war. They thought it would be trench warfare. They thought it would be static line defensive warfare of attrition. And so what did they invest their money in? What was their super weapon? The Maginot Line perhaps one of the most sophisticated military fortification systems in human history, the Maginot Line. Now, we know how this ends, right? Germany, which was almost completely obliterated, it evolved its way of warfare, and it adapted a new way of warfare called the Blitzkrieg that easily outflanked the Maginot Line. And Germany, which was you know, much less powerful than France, they were able to achieve well, what they couldn't achieve in four bloody years of World War I. They achieved in just 46 days in World War II, the capture of Paris. And they did it because they changed their way of warfare, whereas the French remained static in the way of warfare. And even as the panzers were coming down on Paris, French high command and their generals still did not understand what was happening to them as it was occurring. They were so locked into cognitive dissonance. They were paradigm prisoners of a past way of war that it happened before their very eyes and they still couldn't accept it. As one eyewitness said, their minds were too inelastic to new war. That's Victor's curse. It's when war futurists think they're looking forward, but they're really looking in the rear view mirror, and others can exploit that. And for America, our rear view mirror is not World War I, but World War II. We'll come back to that. 
However, there are true war prophets. There are people who see the future of war fairly accurately, but they are almost never believed. I mean, it's, it's an amazing pattern in history that they are never believed. This is another type of curse called Cassandra's curse. No doubt some of you remember Princess Cassandra from Homer's Iliad. She, the gods gave her the gift of prophecy, but the curse that no one would ever believe her. This is Cassandra's curse, and war futurists, real ones, have it. Let's look again 100 years ago at a Cassandra, Billy Mitchell. Now, he was a U.S. Army aviator in World War I, and he saw the future of war, and it was air power. Air power. And when he came back to Washington, D.C. as a one-star, he told all of his colleagues, hey, the future of war is air power. We must start getting ready now. And they said, no, 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 Billy. Sit down, shut up. We all know the future of war is trench warfare. It's static line defense. It's the Maginot Line. And, you know, he said, no, no, it's really, you don't understand. It is, it is airplanes. And they laughed at him and laughed at him. And finally, he said something heretical. He said, in the future, airplanes will sink battleships. Now, when he said this in the early 20s, airplanes were little more than motorized kites in the era of the super dreadnought. So they laughed and howled at him, but Mitchell had some grit, and he convinced the Navy to pull out some captured German battleships from World War II into the Chesapeake Bay, where he did this. He sunk them using airplanes. Now, do you think that this sparked a strategic dialogue within Washington, D.C. about the future of war and what we need to do to prepare for it? No, of course not. The Navy wrote him off as a kook and said to the world that this guy, this is a PR stunt. Nobody should believe him. Uh, this doesn't simulate actual combat conditions. Airplanes cannot sink battleships. We need to invest in more battleships. And of course, he said, no, no, no. It's proof of concept. I'm not saying, you know, this is battle, real life war conditions. It's proof of concept. And this debate escalated and escalated until it bubbled over and entered the national media and congressional politics. This got to become a real embarrassment for the War Department. And General Pershing, who was in the sort of the CGSC, pulled Mitchell aside, perhaps to save Billy's career, and said, Mitchell, I need to get you out of town just for a little while to let this debate simmer down. And so in typical DOD fashion, they assigned Mitchell a one-year tour in the Pacific, the opposite side of the planet, just to get him out of town. Things do simmer down, but Mitchell comes back a year later, and he's holding a report that's two to three inches thick. In this report, he says, on a Sunday morning at 7.30 a.m., Japan will launch a sneak attack on Pearl Harbor using airplanes, and this will suck the U.S. and Japan into a total war for the Pacific. Now, when he said it, it was 1924. 1924, uh, a general officer in the U.S. military predicts Pearl Harbor. Now what happens to Mitchell? Does this now spark a dialogue of strategic debate and the future of war and we need to prepare for it? No, of course not. He gets court-martialed for insubordination at Fort Leslie McNair in Washington, D.C. And it's not just any court-martial. This is like a Kim Kardashian court-martial with paparazzi and witnesses there to tweak up drama and corrupt judges who are thrown out, uh, who are military officers. And the jury, none of which are aviators, finds um, Mitchell guilty of insubordination. And in frustration and anger, Mitchell rips off his uniform, says, Basta, I'm done. And for the last few years of his life in the 1930s, Mitchell crisscrosses the country and talks to anybody who listened to him about the future of war's air power. It's coming. We need to prepare now. People laughed at him and just showed up just to listen to the old kook, but nobody took him seriously. And he died a bitter man. Now, we know how this ends, don't we? Pearl Harbor happens in 1941. Then the U.S. military saw it was caught completely by surprise, even though one of its own generals was standing on desks 15 years earlier predicting this. Now, the reason why 
Mitchell had such a hard time and why all war futurists have Cassandra's curse is this reason. There's a saying by management expert Peter Drucker that culture eats strategy for breakfast, that strategic culture eclipses strategic IQ. And the culture that Mitchell was bumping up against was this, the battleship, for example. So for hundreds of years, if you want to be a four-star admiral, you had to serve on battleships your entire career. You had to command battleships. That was the quickest road to becoming an admiral. The battleship was the king of the sea. And military, well, national might was measured often by these capital ships, by how many battleships you owned. And Mitchell comes along in the 1920s and says, no, 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 the battleship is now obsolete. Now it's going to be the aircraft carrier. That's going to take over. And this was too much for the strategic culture of the day. Not just the Navy, but all of them, the entire military. And the battleship was, in fact, obsolete at the outbreak of World War II. And it took the Battle of Midway for traditionalists of all sides to see it, both Japan and America. It took this battle for them to figure out, because in this battle, perhaps the most decisive naval battle of World War II, perhaps the most decisive naval battle of the 20th century, it wasn't that the two fleets never saw each other. The, the battle was fought completely by naval aviation, as Mitchell predicts. And the battleship after the war is rendered obsolete, right? And the, the aircraft carrier, per Mitchell's prediction, becomes the king of the sea. And it's with Mitchell's legacy that we live today. After World War II, nobody bought battleships anymore. It was all about aircraft carriers. Now, the military didn't really apologize to Mitchell, but they did make up to him in their own way and named a bomber after him in World War II, the B-25 Mitchell bomber. So I argue in the new rules of war that we're facing a Billy Mitchell moment today, now. If I was to ask you, what are the biggest threats in the world? Well, we could spend all day on this question, and we're not going to, thank goodness. But the normal panoply of horrors would emerge, no doubt. You know, China, Russia, nuclear Iran, the continued threat of insurgency and terrorism, narco wars, uh, failed states like Venezuela, mass atrocities like Darfur or the Congo, North Korea. We could keep going on all day about what are the biggest threats. And I would say that as bad as these threats are, they are not the worst. They are not the worst. And in New Rules of War, I talk about durable disorder. This is the biggest threat that some are getting are exploiting, like Russia, and others are getting a, an unwitting bump from, like terrorist groups, and because it's a systemic threat that has been ongoing since at least the end of the Cold War. It's what's left in the wake of the Westphalian system. The Westphalian order is the world that we grew up with in sixth grade, that nation states are the center of global governance, international law, only nation states can have militaries, only they can legitimately wage war. Global governance is about the nation state, and that is eroding. And we're seeing something in the last 30 years pop up to see chaos, persistent conflict entropy, disorder, right? The decay of the so-called rules-based international order, the liberal international order. We're seeing the decline of states everywhere. The data on this from the 1990s alone is very clear and the rise of non-state actors. Like today, the Fortune 500 are more powerful than most states. People think of state strength. They always think of the top 30 states. They never think about the bottom 160 states, which are fragile and weak. And some are just states in name only. And some like Syria and Somalia are just a state on a map, but there's no corresponding state on the ground. 
We're seeing the return of mercenaries everywhere, uh, from Syria to Ukraine to Somalia to Libya to Venezuela to Nigeria to the Congo. I mean, this is how wars are beginning to be fought again. And we're seeing overlapping authorities and allegiances. No longer do the people in Afghanistan feel that they are Afghans first. Of course not. They feel like they're they're a Pashto first and they're from this district second and from this kinship group third. Yeah, and maybe fourth or fifth they are Afghan. So we're seeing overlapping authorities and allegiances, and this is not new. But, but, and here's the big but, this is not anarchy. This is not the sky is falling and we need to invest in more sky. This is not the dark ages, the Knights of Knee. This is simply a messier world order. This is, and it's not new. This is how most of world history has been um, from ancient Rome, which was not a state, by the way, that was an empire controlled by a city, um, to Machiavelli's day. This is what he was talking about in The Prince and the Italian Wars, which was durable disorder. Anybody who's rich enough to hire mercenaries or whatever could wage war for whatever reason they wanted, and mercenaries and others would start and elongate wars for profit, for honor, for you name it. And the wars never quite ended. Does that sound familiar? We're seeing durable disorder creep back into global world order again. Um, you know, half of all peace deals fail in five years. Half. Think about that as the U.S. negotiates with the Taliban. Most countries today are fragile or failed by any metric, and that's increasing since the 1990s. Half of the world's um, countries are in some form of insecurity, whether it's a civil war or a war with others or you name it. And if we think of uh, Weber's classic definition that the state is that entity which has a monopoly of force, how many states in the world have their monopoly challenged? More than half. We're seeing forever wars, conflicts that never end. They just smolder on. Again, the Fortune 500 are more powerful than more states. We're seeing the undeniable rise of mercenaries in the last 30 years where they can challenge states and others. And the rules-based order is without doubt being challenged. And it's not just by entropy, it's by China, it's by Russia. Uh, You know, Russia took the Crimea, a land grab. Where was international order to stop that? Look at Syria's demise. So the point of the book is, and this is sort of the context, is that the Westphalian order is anomalous in history. This idea of a state-centric world order had a beginning, middle, and end. Its beginning might be in the late 17th century, after 1648 going forward. Its middle might be middle of the uh, 19th century, um, the Crimean War, the U.S. Civil War. And its end, somewhere between World War II and the Berlin Wall falling. And now we're going to the status quo ante of what happened before the Thirty Years' War, before the Treaty of West, the Peace of Westphalia. We're going back to normal. Because this idea that states only ruled the world is only a few hundred years old. It's a blip in world history, and we're returning to normal. And that normal looks like durable disorder. Now, those who get this, like Russia and China and insurgent groups and Iran, they can exploit it. Those who do not are exploited. And the West, and the U.S. in particular, I argue, is exploited because the U.S., in my opinion, is doing this. U.S. foreign policy is trying to do the Humpty Dumpty approach of putting the liberal world-based order back together as we imagine it. Whether that order really ever existed is up for debate. Whether it's feasible to put it back together, I think is not up for debate. The so-called horses have fled the barn. Yet this is a doomed foreign policy, a Humpty Dumpty approach. Now, moving forward as a new kind of world order generates a new kind of warfare. And the new rules of war give you 10 rules to fight and win in this new kind of warfare. You can call them rules, ideas, principles. I don't really care. To me, that's semantics. Um, But we need to think strategically different the way that the Germans did in the 1930s. And that's what the new rules of war explain to us. Now, to some extent, the 2018 U.S. National Defense Strategy understands this. It says, look, 
global disorder is really the problem. It's not, um, you know, it's it's not terrorism and insurgency. It's global disorder. And now we're entering an era where we're entering what they say is great power competition. Great power competition really means we're moving away from, you know, sort of, you know, Al-Qaeda and Taliban as primary threats. They never were, in my opinion to these two guys in particular, to Russia and China. These are our new threats. And you know what? They're exploiting this disorder. So great power competition. But here's the problem. And this is not intended by the those who wrote the National Defense Strategy of 2018 did not intend this, but this is how it's being read across Washington, D.C. They assume many people in the national security community of Washington, D.C., read most, think that if there is going to be a major conflict between the United States and China or Russia, that it'll be a conventional fight. It'll be a World War II fight. So think of conventional warfare. It's a type of warfare. It's not war. There's not such thing as conventional war. It's a type of warfare. It's not timeless or universal. It's the Westphalian way of war. It's World War II. It's, it's, the, it's the war that international laws of armed conflict imagine us fighting. And I argue, no, it's not going to be that way at all. That conventional war is waning. Conventional war is dead. It died in 1945. It's a way of war that started with Napoleon and ended with World War II. In the, the Cold War was certainly not a conventional war. Uh, it was, a, you know, nuclear war is not conventional. All the irregular war things that the USSR did and the USA did are not regular. And if there would be a conflict between World War II, you know, like World War III, it would not look like Tom Clancy's Red Storm riding, Rising, which was just World War II with better technology. In that ridiculous book that people thought of as, you know, the future, um, you know, th- there was no nuclear exchange, which is which is highly unlikely. And we can continue talking about the foolery of Tom Clancy uh, later. But rule number one of my 10 new rules is this. Conventional war is over. Now, this makes most conventional warriors' heads explode. And that's okay with me because we are, otherwise, it's the Maginot mentality. It's this idea that the future wars will look just like the last wars. And so for World War II era thinkers, the History Channel, Tom Clancy, etc., this is um, irrational. It's absurd. It's dangerous. But the data on this is very, very clear. There is nothing more unconventional today than a conventional war. So here is a gold-plated data set on warfare. From 1945 to 2015, the red line on the bottom, that's almost flatlined, that's conventional war. That's traditional interstate warfare. That's Westphalian war, World War II-style warfare. The blue line on the top is everything else. And as you can see, that is rising and rising and rising. And that's conservative. It doesn't even include things like the Rwanda genocide, the Darfur genocide, which you know, to a conventional warrior, that's not war. It's something else. And my question is, well, what do you think it is? An 800,000 person homicide? It makes no sense. They are paradigm prisoners like the French high command um, during the Blitzkrieg. So, you know, no one fights conventionally anymore except for the United States, except for the West and NATO. Russia doesn't fight conventionally. China doesn't fight conventionally. Iran, nobody fights conventionally. You know, Al-Qaeda, certainly not. Taliban, certainly not. Because warfare has moved on. Warfare hasn't been conventional since 1945. There's a few exceptions, but that's what they are. They're exceptions. Now, if we look at what kind of war is the U.S. preparing for, a valid question, the answer is actually quite easy to discern. I say budgets are moral documents because they do not lie. Budgets reveal policy, whether it's hidden policy or it's strategic culture or it's deliberate policy. Now, let's look at the U.S. budget. The U.S. takes defense very seriously, more seriously than any other country in the world. When I say defense, I really mean military kinetic defense. Over half of the U.S. federal discretionary budget is committed to the military, which is, in my opinion, absurd, 
absurd, more than all the other the interagency combined. And if you compare the U.S.'s military spending with the other top seven or eight nations, it's bigger than all of them combined too. I mean, we dwarf China, we dwarf Russia. You know, we so what are we doing with our military? Well, I say let's take a look at the shopping list because this reveals all. You look at what we're, you know, what weapons we're buying reveals where we're placing our bets for the future of war. So here are top acquisitions for fiscal year 18. It's representative of acquisitions the last five years. Now, if you look at this list, the top 10, you know, F-35s, Battle Force like Navy ships, F-18 fighter jets, uh, like tactical vehicles, helicopters, what kind of weapons are these for? What kind of fight are they anticipating? Conventional warfare. These are all conventional warfare weapons. Even though nobody, we haven't, the U.S. has not fought a conventional war since the 1950s, the Korean War. That's what we're investing in. Since then, we've been, you know, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and we've struggled and lost. But what are we still bidding on the future? Conventional war. It's the very definition of insanity. Now, I have friends and colleagues who say, okay, McFate, fine, but all those weapons can also do unconventional war too. And my response to them is, yeah, and a Ferrari can tow a boat. It doesn't make it a good idea. Let's pick on one particularly, the F-35, because this in some ways is the most egregious of the examples, but you know, it's it's typical as well. It's not unique. Now, this the F-35 is a single-seat fighter jet plane that is pretty awesome. It's pretty, it's it's like without doubt, perhaps the most or one of the most sophisticated machines that human minds and hands have ever dreamed up and created. The cockpit is like a bunch of iPads. The pilot wears these these special visors on his helmet so he or she can see through the airplane in a dogfight, like like X-ray vision. This plane can do air-to-air, air-to-ground, espionage, collective targeting for other, in a a battlefield space, it can fly through and, and, you know, collectively target instantaneously all sorts of fires in the air or on the ground or at sea to high value targets. It's pretty amazing. But there's only one problem. This thing is already obsolete. It's like the battleship was in 1940. The U.S. has been constantly at war since 9-11, you know, 20, almost 20 years. And this thing has zero combat missions, zero combat missions. Now, the measure of worth of any weapon system is its utility. 20 years at war, zero combat missions. I'm an old infantry grunt. We would say that dog don't hunt. That dog don't hunt. Uh, and not only that, but it's, uh, let's think about its price tag. This weapon system is without doubt the most expensive weapon system in American history, arguably world history. It costs taxpayers and allies $1.5 trillion dollars and counting and counting if this airplane well that is more money to put that in perspective that is more money than russia's gdp on a single seat airplane that doesn't go to war if this airplane were a nation state its gdp would be ranked 11th in the world ahead of saudi arabia ahead of india and brazil it is crazy it's nutsoid it's bonkers and yet we're buying more you know and for some of you out there who are starting out the cost of flying this airplane per hour is twice as much as an f-16 or f-15 it's 40 to forty-five thousand dollars an hour to fly and it doesn't even do good job as a fighter jet it gets repeatedly blown out of the sky in mock battles with with 40-year-old F-16s and 40-year-old F-15s. So what is it doing? It does nothing. And this is part of our problem. Rule number two is technology will not save us. The American strategic culture fetishizes war technology. Meanwhile, and we want to invest in better war technology. Meanwhile, for the last 70 years, Luddites have been beating us. Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, Luddites, technological primitives. If there's one lesson in modern war, it's this, is that technology is irrelevant 
to win modern wars. It's not just us. It's also, you know, the French in Indochina and Algeria, the Soviets in Afghanistan. Luddites have been routinely beating highly sophisticated, highly advanced technological militaries since World War II. So rule number two is technology will not save us, and that the F-35 is like our Maginot line. It's giving us a false sense of security to fight last century's war and not this century. And this is partly what the new rules of war is trying to fight. It assumes that future wars will look like past successful ones, but with better technology. And look at how many think tank events in Washington, D.C. take this as their basic basic thesis. The future of war, a think tank event, it's about World War II with better technology. The U.S. military would like to imagine the South China Sea as midway fought with four class carriers and F-35s. And of course, that's never going to happen, right? The Maginot mentality. In fact, you can even ask this question, as I do in my book, are we already at war with Russia and, and or China and don't know it? Are they employing a boil the frog slowly strategy of turning up the heat so gradually that we don't know we're at war until it's too late? Because they have strategic patience and the United States does not. And could they be weaponizing that for strategic advantage? I think the answer is yes. Let's look at the South China Sea. So in the old rules of, of war, you know, the South China Sea is a contested area right now in the world. Um, in the old rules of war, we'd throw in aircraft carrier groups, as we do now, to create deterrence. But deterrence no longer works, right? The new rules of war, aircraft carriers, the threat of kinetic force deters no one. We, you know, China has been gradually winning the South China Sea, one island, and really perhaps one ally at a time. And that's the true prize of the South China Sea. It's not rocks of seagull turds, it's allies, right? And they're doing it with zero aircraft carriers, right? So what are they doing that we're not doing? Well, they understand rule number three of the new rules of war, that there's no such thing as war or peace. Both coexist always. We in the United States, we in international law, we in the West think of war and peace like pregnancy. You either are or you're not. Or you think of it like a light switch. It's either on or it's off. And as, as any American admiral will tell you, hey, you know, in secret, flip that light switch to on. We'll take care of the South China Sea in one afternoon. One afternoon. It's all we need. China knows that. They know we have this false dichotomy of war or peace, and they exploit it by getting right in between the space between war and peace in our mind. They go right, they play a dangerous game of chicken where they go right up to the edge of war in the South China Sea and they stop right where we'd flip that light switch to on and they stop, but they keep everything they capture or create. And done enough times, this gradual incrementalism is winning them the South China Sea with zero aircraft carriers, which with an inferior navy. They're playing strategic jujitsu with us using rule number three, you know, the, using a new rule of war. So what does war actually look like in durable disorder? Will there be hot wars? Well, war is getting sneakier. Okay, it's getting sneakier. Look at, I talk about something called shadow wars. And rule number nine, I say shadow wars will dominate. Wars, if you look at conflicts like Ukraine, Libya, and Syria, they are prototypes for modern warfare in the same way that the Spanish Civil War was presaging World War II. So if you look at Ukraine, for example, in the old rules of war, when the Soviets wanted to put their boot on somebody's neck, they rolled in the tanks. They used the threat, or they did use kinetic force. Think of Hungary 56, Czechoslovakia 68. Now, in 2014, when they wanted to roll into Ukraine, they could have blitzkrieged Ukraine. They had their military com compared to Ukraine, could have easily taken out Ukraine, and Ukraine's not a NATO member, right? But that's not what they did. They instead used a new rules of war approach. 
they they flooded the countryside with a ghost occupation force of covert means. They used weapons that gave what were clandestine. So Spetsnaz special forces, mercenaries like the Wagner Group, Little Green Men, these astroturfed fake Russian separatist militias in Donetsk, etc., and lots of dense propaganda and active measures. Now, they created the fog of war, so when Western policymakers were still scratching their head and figuring out what the heck was going on in eastern Ukraine, their Crimea was a fait accompli. And only then did the conventional war weapons show up after all the fighting had been done. Only then did the tanks and destroyers show up, just as a, you know, sort of making it clear to the West who took Crimea and who it belongs to now. That is a shadow war. Now, occasionally, shadow wars bubble to the surface and they hit headline news, but they try to go back as quickly as possible into the shadows because the reason is this, and Russia knows this, is that the reason why, um, well, we live in a global information age and weapons that give you plausible deniability like special forces, like mercenaries, like propaganda, Weapons that give you plausible deniability are more important than raw firepower. That is why you know the media, the information age is driving warfare underground because if you want to wage war, at best be in secret, and then you can come out for your debut once it's all done, like Crimea. And Libya and Syria are wars that are largely waged in secret. We don't know who exactly is on the ground there. We don't know who they're fighting for. We don't know why. We just know there's armed conflict, right? And look at Syria. Syria is another example. So look at, you know, you see refugees on the screen, I hope. Now, in the old rules of war, the Soviets and the Russians have always had a same strategic objective of to disunite Europe, to weaken Europe, to create fissions within the European alliance system. In the old rules of war, the Soviets would have these massive military exercises on the border of East and West Germany. And this would freak out NATO because NATO didn't know if this was a real military exercise or if it was a ruse to, before a full-on invasion. Um, and this created stress fractures. Now, when the Russia now wants to create stress fractures in the European Union, what they do is they weaponize refugees. They bomb civilian centers in Syria to create an avalanche or a tidal wave of refugees that would crash on the shores of the European Union. And this would beget the Brexit, the rise of right-wing national politics that wants to break the EU from inside out. The Politburo would have loved for such a strategic outcome. So Syria also shows us other ways of warfare that are not ethical, they're not moral, and they're certainly not rules, you know, uh, laws of war, but this is the direction of modern warfare. Rule number six is that mercenaries will return. So this is one of the biggest rises of a new class of warrior, or actually a resurrection of a very old class of warrior. Some would say this is the second oldest profession of mercenaries everywhere, and they're always in the shadows um, because they give you good plausible deniability. Libya right now is mercenary on mercenary warfare. Different sides are using mercenaries. You know, Turkey has its mercenaries, the UAE has their, and Russia have their mercenaries, and there's other mercenaries on the ground too. We don't really know who they represent and why. So Libya is like medieval warfare with mercenary and mercenary. We see former SEALs and ex-Green Berets in Yemen and Venezuela. Uh, these ones in Yemen allegedly are acting as a hit squad, a death squad for a Middle Eastern monarchy. We're seeing mercenaries of the sea, and we're seeing insurance companies are, and even the U.S. Navy in secret saying, hey, you should invest in, if you're going through pirate waters, invest in embarked security, which are these guys who sit on ta oil tankers and freighters, and they fight off any uh, pirates. We're seeing Nigeria hiring um, you know, mercenaries who showed up with special operations forces and attack helicopters like MI-24 Hind helicopters. The, you know, mercenaries today are not like the, the guys in the Congo in the 1960s, you know, have Kalishnikov, will travel. Today they're very, very sophisticated and they're very, very lethal. 
We're seeing the Peshmerga. We're seeing American vets showing up and to join, you know, to kill ISIS during the when ISIS was a thing as mercenaries. We've been seeing cyber mercenaries called hackback companies, which we can discuss in a Q and A if we actually have opportunity to do so. So we're seeing the rise of mercenaries everywhere, a trend that keeps on growing, and international law cannot fight it, cannot solve it, because mercenaries can kill your law enforcement dead. And anyway, who's going to go into Libya to arrest all those mercenaries? The United Nations? Of course not. When you have new mercenaries, that means new types of world powers can rule. Because now that you have mercenaries in the marketplace, and now that it's becoming normalized in international relations... Um, you know, the global 0.0001%, billionaires, the Fortune 500, can they can defend their own international security interests without having to rely on what they consider to be corrupt countries. So look at the oil industry. It has to rely on countries like Nigeria, which are notoriously corrupt and shaking down these countries, uh, these companies. So now that they have options with mercenaries, why the, many of them are going to mercenary. And this means that in the future, we will start to see wars without states. If you have mercenaries, if you have mercenary supply and, you know, billionaires and Fortune 500 demand, they can go to war. Oil companies can go to war if they want. And states now, rather than being drivers of war, as was the Westphalian model, are now booty of war to be won. And we're already seeing this in south of the U.S. border, in Latin America, specifically in Mexico. Uh, we're seeing narco wars. Now, strangely, Washington, D.C views these as criminality and not war. It's kind of curious to see what the National Security Committee privileges as war, even though that more people died in Mexico in 2017-18 due to narco wars than Iraq or Afghanistan. Yet Iraq and Afghanistan are considered wars where narco, what well, Mexico is not. It's irrational, right? That's the Westphalian model. But in Central America, you have states captured by narcos, and they're called narco states like Salvador and Guatemala, and many would argue Mexico. So if you look at Latin America through a more of a like a medieval lens rather than a, a Westphalian lens, it makes more sense. Same with the Middle East. If you take states out of it and you look at the power boundaries of narcos, that it looks like a real war and it's fought according to the new rules of war and states are bystanders. That's what the future of war looks like. Not in North America, not in East, you know, Western Europe or Eastern Asia, but for most parts of the world, that's what warfare looks like in Sub-Saharan Africa and much of the Middle East and much of South Asia. Uh, parts, you know, war is not does not look like World War II, right? And one reason is is that today the best weapons may not fire bullets. So in the old rules of war, in World War II, conventional war, cloth fits, you won with battlefield victory. That's who determined winners and losers. Battlefield victory, Waterloo, Gettysburg, Midway, Stalingrad, you name it. Today, that's that doesn't matter. This is how you tell, you know, winners and losers is about telling truth from lies. And Russia knows this. They are trying to swing very close elections, the U.S. presidential election, EU elections, the Brexit. And, they, and the reason that they know, they, they know is because war is um, telling truth from lies now. That's how you determine winners and losers. And the strategic logic is compelling. Who cares about the sword if you can control the hand that wields it? And that's why they want to, you know, find a pro a pro Russia president in the United States rather than an anti Russian. It's much more effective than trying to go conventional tete on tete with America. In fact, we also know in modern war that battlefield victory means nothing. You know, we all remember this: President George W. Bush in 2003 saying, "Mission accomplished after the invasion of Iraq." Well, we had achieved battlefield victory. And the conventional warriors said, well, that's it. Let's go home. Easy, easy peasy. And of course, battlefield victory was irrelevant in 2003. Irrelevant. Just like the Vietnam War. We, the U.S. had won almost every battle of the Vietnam War, but it, yet it lost the war. How did that happen? Well, the North Vietnamese were fighting a new rules of war fight. The U.S. was fighting a very conventional old rules of war fight. 
We lost, just like we lost in Iraq and Afghanistan, if we're being honest. Now, the reason why rule number five is the best rules do not fire bullets is because war is becoming epistemological. Now, epistemology in philosophy is, is asking, how do you know what you know? How do you know what you know? And it turns out in a global information age, strategic deception is more valuable than kinetic firepower. Again, think of Russia and Ukraine creating the fog of war. Um, so, you know, and this is how bad it gets. Deep fakes, for example. Deep fakes is something that people can do, almost anybody, not everybody, can do in their living room. This is not an NSA thing or MIT thing. You can get software and you could do something like this. I want you to think about how much ruckus you could fire up if, if you were asked to do so. enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this? Simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you. And stay woke, bitches. Now think what you could do if asked with that type of technology. And this is getting to the point that rule 10 is victory is fungible. There's many ways to win and lose wars. Battlefield victory is just one of them. And the new rules of war book lays out other types of things like weaponizing time and sort of a Maoist Fabian strategy and some other ones, which are not really new. They're just forgotten in our time, right? So victory now goes to the cunning and not just the strong. Warfare is moving from an era of Clausewitzian paradigm of World War II into a Sun Tzuian paradigm of today, right? So let me ask you, I'll give you an example of this. When was the last time any of you saw a Hollywood movie with China as the villain? Any, think of any? We've got Russian villains, we've got terrorist villains. It seems that China would be an obvious villain. Well, you know what? You can't. You can't because China bought Hollywood. And they bought it legally. Uh, Legacy Studios is a Chinese-owned company. Uh, next time you see a movie, th look at all the pre-credits, like studio production pre-credits before a movie. See if any of those are Mandarin in the future. And you know what? They're building their own Hollywood to surpass ours someday, they hope. They know that war is getting epistemological, just like Russia does. And they are investing in a strategic influence WMD. And they get to green light movies that make them look good, like The Martian. And they get to kibosh movies that make them look bad. And this is why you'll never see a Hollywood victim, a uh, Hollywood bad guy. And they're also getting into the business themselves. So this came out in 2017, Wolf Warrior 2. And in Wolf Warrior 2, it's it's like it's a Chinese movie that grossed over $800 million. That's like George Clooney money, all right? And in this movie, it's like this roguish Chinese Rambo goes to Africa. He's like a, he's an ex special forces guy. Uh, he's hardcore like Rambo, and his enemies are like American Blackwater contractors who are horrible to the African people. And the Chinese in China saves the African people, and they do it through you know the roguish hero Wolf Warrior Two, eight hundred million dollars. A form of victory is this. Forget, you know, battlefield victory on Iraq or Vietnam. A form of victory is that all of our grandkids speak Mandarin as a second language and are sympathetic to Beijing values.
You say, well, that's not a victory of war. Well, guess what? It's what we did in the Cold War to Germany. By the end of the Cold War, Germans were all, West Germans are all speaking English and sympathetic to liberal democracy. Their ancestors in the 30s and 20s would have been aghast. That is what real, durable victory looks like. Forget Klaus Witzian victory. As Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan show, it proves nothing. It is, that's an old way of war. And wars do not end with peace treaties. Think about that with the Taliban. Over half of all peace treaties fail today, right? So don't expect any Missouri moments in modern warfare. This is how conventional wars end, Westphalian wars end. Victory now is an infinite game. Think of it like in the business cycle. Coke and Pepsi, you have an up cycle, you have a down cycle. An up quarter, a down quarter. You don't obliterate Pepsi. You don't obliterate Coke like conventional war demands. You know, it's an, you have good years, you have bad years. It's, it's competition. Curiously, we used to think this way. The U.S. used to think this way during the Cold War, but somehow forgot in the last 30 years, which is an interesting discussion point. So again, victory goes to the cunning, not just the strong. And this is the point of the new rules of war, is to break old paradigms, our imaginal mentality, and explain how to win new rules, new, uh, how to win new modern wars. They look new to us, but actually the world's been fighting this way for 70 years. We've just been stuck in the past. So the rest of the world gets it, but we do not. So one, conventional war is dead. Two, Technology, like big war, like F-35 technology, will not save us. The military-industrial complex will not save us. We need new types of technologies, technologies that help us win epistemological warfare. Three, there's no such thing as war or peace. Both exist always. We knew this during the Cold War. We forgot ever since. But this is what China, this is how China is winning against the United States. Rule number four, hearts and minds do not matter. What this means is... Rule number four means that, is that counterinsurgency, as America practiced it in Iraq and Afghanistan, is failed strategy. Not because it was fail, not because it was implemented poorly. It was conceived poorly from the get-go. Low strategic IQ con- conceived coin. If you really want to know how to do counterinsurgency, I explain in this rule how to do how it's done. Think about how the U.S. settled the West in the 19th century. It's bloody. It's immoral, and it takes a very long time with a serious commitment. That's not what FM 3-24 does in Iraq, Afghanistan. Now, at the strategic level of warfare, hearts and minds are key, as Hollywood demonstrates, right? As Russia demonstrates with their disinformation campaigns. Rule number five. The best weapons do not fire bullets. Again, think of disinformation campaigns. Think of Hollywood. And Russia has a different approach. The difference between disinformation and misinformation is disinformation is deliberately made to fool you. Uh, Think of the troll factory in Russia. Think of fake news, a real thing. Uh, Misinformation is when somebody innocently passes it along thinking it's real. So Russia's disinformation campaign, they're not trying to create a counter-narrative the way Russia, the way China is with Hollywood, as China is the superhero, not the supervillain. Russia doesn't care about that. What they're doing is they're trying to load the information space with so much disinformation, with so much bullshit, frankly, that people in the West, that people in the United States stop even trusting any news source and they shrug their shoulders and that's a for you don't you don't create a counter narrative you just get it to so nobody trusts any narrative right rule number six seven and eight are a troika mercenaries are returning international law is powerless to stop it and there's lots of reasons why both powerful nations like russia and the u.s use them and weak nations that are rich like uae uses them as well as you know the fortune 500 billionaires oligarchs are already using them and now that you have uh, this new type of warfare that is it's liberated from nation state you're going to see wars without states you're going to see oligarchs, the super rich will become superpowers eventually, fighting wars where states are sidelined. And to some extent, this has already happened in the narco wars in Latin America. Rule number nine is that shadow wars will dominate. 
We live in a global information age where you want to wage war in secret because um, if you get punished if you don't. So this is driving war into the shadows where weapons that give you plausible deniability like special forces, mercenaries, you know, things like that are more preferable, more effective than raw firepower. This is Sun Tzuian warfare. It's not Klaus Witzian warfare. And lastly, rule number 10, victory is fungible. There are many ways to win. We all know that right now in the United States of America, there is a you know cultural war going on between red states and blue states, Fox and CNN, Republicans and Democrats. Now, we know that democracy is messy, and we've been here before, and if it's just an organic family feud, that's okay, but that's not what's happening, right? We have foreign powers reaching in to our, to our country, waging information warfare to try to find existing seams in our fabric, like racism, and ripping those apart through inflammatory means, um, using fake news to, you know, to frame or be framed world. And this is the point of rule number 10. You know, battlefield victory is one way to win, but there's other ways too that are, are cheaper and don't involve kinetic firepower. If you can subvert a democracy from the inside out, if you can rot it from the inside out so it collapses in on itself, that is a form of victory. And that is what our adversaries, Russia, China, and others are trying to do. They're trying to, to make us turn on each other so we do the heavy lifting for them. How successful they are in doing this is a point of great discussion and debate but that they're trying to do this is not up for de debate. The intelligence community and others consensus on this. So I hope you check out the new rules of war. It's being read in many national security committees around the world. Um, it's, it's provocative, but it's meant to start a conversation and not end it. And the point of this book is that the US and the West can do very well in modern warfare if we just change the way we think about it, if we can overcome our victor's curse and break our Maginot mentality. You can check out more of my uh, writings and what I'm up to on my website, seanmcfate.com. Uh, I do answer email queries, inquire at seanmcfate.com, and you can follow me on Twitter, at Sean McFate. Good luck, and I hope to see you somewhere down the road fighting the new rules of war.